Welcome to NeuroNoodle's Neurofeedback and Neuropsychology Podcast, featuring tech legend Jake Gunkelman. He's the man who has read well over half a million brain scans, and Dr. Marie Swingle, author of iMinds. Our goal is to provide information and promote options for better mental health. The NeuroNoodle Podcast is supported by listeners and businesses just like you. Dr. Marie Swingle and Jay Gunkelman. Good morning. There we are. Nice picture. There I am. There we oh, go. Man, I'm yeah. just getting mine kicked in as well. <laughs> Dr. Marie, you're a ray of sunshine. <laughs> Jay, you and I are just a couple dudes. <laughs> <laughs> So is that our new band name, Sunshine and the Dudes? Hey. I'm I'm best as a no comment, you know. So <laughs> I don't know that 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 doesn't sound as you know. Yeah, cool. and, and and we've got uh, our oh, co-host yeah. here, uh, that's right, that's uh, right. A- actively on duty, uh, <laughs> the uh, heated weighted blanket effect, you know, keeps oh, me yes. calmed down. So. <laughs> So, so Jane, Doctor Marie, what do you th- what do you think about pain? Any thoughts? Yeah, well, I think this is going to be largely Jay's show. I'll, I'll pipe in here and there, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's one of the most complex. No pain. Are you pain. saying I'm a pain? <laughs> oh, I'm saying you're very knowledgeable gentlemen, and I'm bowing to your expertise. Um, that's the no. that, that's the name, pain in the backsides. Good recovery, good recovery. Um, you know, um, I think I sent a, along already a, a publication, uh, Cambridge University Press. Um, it's actually a bit dated, but uh, pain is still pain, and the techniques that are mentioned in there are still techniques that are mentioned. So um, uh, it, it was a chapter in a book on non pharmacological pain management, and it's a it's a text for uh, professionals that are in medical school uh, uh, orienting towards pain management. Yeah. So uh, it, it was written with Gabriel Tan, um, uh, uh, Mark Jensen, who talked about hypnosis and, and pain management. So I wasn't, it wasn't a sole authorship uh, for the chapter, but I talked about TMS, TDCS, Neurofeedback, um, um, you know the the non pharmacological um, um, voltage gated ion channel approach to control, mm-hmm. and uh, that all of that preceded any of the work that's more current on thalamocortical dysrhythmia, uh, which is uh, a way to also uh, perceive pain. Um, uh, we, we worked uh, with uh, the last few months of my uh, still writing reports. Um, I worked with a pain surgeon who did thalamotomies with a gamma knife. Uh, which sounds kind of radical, but for uh, for chronic pain, they can point these gamma rays all to a spot and blast that spot, and it won't work anymore. Well, if it's a relay at the thalamic level for pain, you can blast that away. Um, it he had about a fifty percent success rate, which doesn't. I mean, that doesn't sound great. But if you get a chronic pain patient and you tell them you have a half a chance of getting rid of your pain with this surgery, you have a half a chance. They will say, "Sign me up." Yeah. You know, I mean, it's half a chance. It's not like no chance, which is what they've got. Yeah. So um, what we tried to do is simply to tell him which patient had a thalam- thalamocortical dysrhythmia. And the ones who had that, he would do the surgery. And the ones who didn't, it isn't like we were telling them that they didn't have pain. It's that they had a kind of pain that wasn't the kind that you could blast away at the thalamus and fix. So his success rate went up to 80%. Now, 
you know, if you give me 50, 50 odds, I don't go to Vegas. But if you give me 80, 20 odds, I come back with loads of dough. So the, the odds were much better. And the surgeon was happy, but you know who was really happy? Risk management. You know, the hospital, when you have a surgery that's not successful, you have a, an increased probability of some sort at some level of the person being upset enough to find a lawyer. And they'll find you. You don't have to go looking. You know, uh, uh, th this is the age of litigation. And uh, hospitals get litigation uh, f after failed surgeries. You know, an old friend of mine uh, reached out to me not too long ago and He's always suffered from neuropathy. I know you're going to uh, get to it, but, you know, at the time, I didn't know anything about the brain when I knew sure. the guy. And uh, he had to wear gloves because he couldn't touch anything because it hurt his hands so yeah. much. And I, I just couldn't couldn't believe something like that uh, exists out there. Is you that know, all in your head? or when you, when you were a kid in Chicago, you went out skating, and you probably skated a little longer than you should have. And your feet got little, like, way cold, and you had to go into the warming house and take your skates off and warm up your feet, and they were prickly and like needles and pins. Right, right, right. Well, that's what a peripheral neuropathy feels like. And uh, the, what they've done is they've lost some neurological relay uh, through whatever process. I mean, there's lots of different ways to do it. Most common uh, you know, diabetic uh, neuropathy, that, that's, that's probably the most common. And quite honestly, there's a lot more diabetic neuropathy than one might think. You know, it's, it's not just the people that are injecting insulin that end up having enough problems to end up with a peripheral neuropathy. You can have adult onset uh, diabetes um, uh, from, you know, type 2 diabetes and have peripheral neuropathies, and that's very common. And the needles and pins or numbness um, uh, are, are problems, and if you start to have a peripheral neuropathy, if you watch their uh, gait, the, how, how they walk, uh, when it gets advanced enough, they have what's called clown's feet, uh, where when the heel hits, the, the toes flop. You know, clowns have these big floppy shoes, and they flop, 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 flop. Well, when you see somebody walking and their gait is a little broader, their widespread gait and they're floppy, uh, that, that's a peripheral neuropathy that's fairly advanced. Now, it's not uncommon in advanced, you know, diabetic neuropathy, but it's also present in peripheral neuropathy from alcoholism. Yeah. And uh, the, the spread gait clown feet is a, uh, is a classic advanced alcoholism. Um, and about that time, they also start to have Korsakoff syndrome, so, which is uh, a B1 vitamin deficiency is all it is. Uh, and your brain ends up with an irretrievable slowing. Uh, it, it, it's a, it's a, a pathological a change due to chronic alcoholism and not eating properly, you know, and <laughs> if B1 was added to alcohol, it would get rid of that neuropathy in, entirely, but the alcohol uh, manufacturers would have to agree that their uh, uh, product has a risk of that. Uh, so it, it's, it, it, you know, uh, it's the quote of the day, Jay. Yeah. I love the B to alcohol and all problems <laughs> shall be solved. <laughs> So what we end up with is, is lots of different kinds of pain and peripheral neuropathies are awful. Um, they, they do have some pharmacological interventions, but there are also interventions with respect to brain function as well. One of the things that you have in your brain is the ability to focus your attention. And if you have an anterior cingulate that's locked onto the pain and you basically are focused on the pain, uh, that, that part of the pain network is sometimes referred to as the distress network. It's the salience network, damn it. It's the same exact network. 
It's got a different name when you talk about pain. But when you're obsessed about the pain, you amplify it, literally. You're, you intend to perceive. That's attention. And when you have an overfocus on something that's painful, you will feel it more intensely. Just like if you have a ringing in your ears and you focus on the ringing in your ears, you can get it louder. Uh, if you're if, if you pay attention right now, sitting there, what do your feet feel like? You didn't pay attention to your feet for the last little bit. Well, what do they feel like? Shift your attention around. You can feel things that you didn't necessarily focus on enough to attend to previously. The intention to perceive is attention. And we can shine the flashlight of attention on all sorts of different issues, not just somatosensory, somatomotor, but other uh, issues cognitively as well. If so I can jump in here, Jay, a little bit, you know, kind of put a psychology hat on this. This is one of the major issues when we talk about any type of, you know, complex somatic uh, pain syndrome is a lot of individuals just are not believed. Uh, they're told they're exaggerating things, et cetera, et cetera. So you essentially reinforce the attention by our lack of acceptance or belief in the client's reported symptoms. So all of you working with pain, this is a huge dimension um, that, that we need to really, really acknowledge that we do not become part of the problem uh, in terms of exciting uh, that network, even more forcing the patient to uh, focus more on the pain in order to get proper attention. Uh, and then of course, you, the people loop into the pharmaceuticals, et cetera, et cetera. So I just wanted to make that really, really big point here so i learned about pain early on in my clinical work in 1972 we we had a laboratory and we were just kids we didn't know shit about what we were doing you know and um what do you do well we we brought in lots of different patients and we did physiological profiles we hooked up all the weird equipment we had and did measurements and one young woman who was severely depressed came in. We hooked up EMG levels on her forearm extensor, the most voluntary muscle in your arm, the one that wiggles your fingers. You put, put the electrodes on your forearm. And the, the electrode uh, uh, meter was pegging high, hundreds of microvolts, and then pegging low microvolt or so. High, low, high, low. We said, can you feel that? And she said, no have no sense of any change at all in the forearm. So we thought, well, maybe we got a funky amp. We got a one in the other room. We ran, grabbed the other amp, came in, put it on the same thing, pegs. And she, we, 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 you know, when the patient says they can't feel it, you've got to kind of think, well, they probably can't feel it. So, uh, and you've, if you swing hundreds of microvolts of EMG, pegging from a microvolt to a few hundred, you kind of have to almost try. That, that's, that's a lot of EMG tension, uh, the, the microvoltage to actually contract a muscle. So it puzzled me. And I'm thinking, how do you not feel something in your forearm? And because you're depressed. And we started to look into the literature at the time uh, there's something called peripheral glucose uptake, and you can measure the gl glucose going into the arm, blood glucose, and the glucose coming back out of the arm, uh, arterial and venous uh, glucose levels. And you can tell how much you're burning peripherally. Well, in depression, there's a decreased peripheral glucose uptake. Well, get somebody who's depressed and somebody who's not depressed. The depressed person gains weight because they're not burning blood sugar in a way that they normally would metabolically. So uh, we, we, we thought, well, that uh, maybe there's uh, a, a weird uh, thing with her metabolic function or something. So we brought her back in. We measured her acupuncture points, which were little hot electronegative hot spots at, at the tips of your fingers. You can see classical charts and just a little tiny pinpoint. If you're a couple millimeters off, you, you don't have the, the measurement at all. And uh, her electronegative hot spots weren't electronegative. They, they were electropositive. 
and with respect to a neutral spot on the arm. So I'm thinking, you know, those fingers I cut off, they hurt. And, and, and they, you know, there isn't really a joint there. This is just bone on bone splinters on bone splinters. And I never did find the tip of the little finger. That's there's, there's a piece of steel and I, I whacked the end of that and it really kind of stings. And North Dakota has minus 40 degrees in the winter. You know what a severed and reattached finger feels like at minus 40 degrees? You don't want to know. So I'm thinking this young lady has a trick that I want to learn because this hurts, you know? So um, it, uh, I, uh, I, I had equipment that could measure DC and I started to measure the acupuncture points and uh, learn how to control the DC electronegativity that was present. And when you are not present, when you can go electropositive with those acupuncture points, you can predict the lack of pain sensation. Uh, there's, there's actually literature about that. You can predict the lack of pain, whether it's induced from a general anesthesia, local anesthesia, uh, 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 nerve blockade, hypnosis, whatever uh, does something that's going to make you not feel a pinprick in your hand, you can pre predict it based on yeah, that. So uh, um, I basically just learned that. I learned how to warm my hands because we had temperature devices, and I, I learned how to control the electronegative uh, to go electropositive where pain things hurt. And you're, it's, it's like you're just not there. Uh, you, you don't attend to it. If you pay attention, things become electronegative neurologically. Uh, the neurons are, are, are prepped and activated and ready to be used. Um, the bright shaft's potential, for instance, is electronegative uh, swing as you intend to move. The same thing goes electronegative when you intend to perceive. You can switch your attention from one visual field to the other, even though you don't change your focus at the center, and you can see which visual field you're really paying attention to. So th this electronegative stuff was really uh, quite, uh, quite the trick. And uh, I actually had friends of mine who uh, uh, <laughs> thought it was kind of nuts going without a glove at minus 40 just to kind of kick the tires on the skill set, you know. <laughs> um, but, but uh, you know, you could keep your hand warm enough and not feel the pain in the severed and reattached fingers, uh, even at minus 40 with no glove. And I wouldn't re recommend that. I mean, it's, you, you do it very long, you, you end up with a frostbite. That's, yeah, it, you can lose pieces. So uh, um, I learned that, but you can teach that with slow cortical potential training. Uh, you can, stimulate that with DC stim, transcranial DC stim, uh, you can change the uh, electronegative profile in the body with hypnosis. You know, hypnosis gives you, you can have hypnosis that gives you a numb hand, but there's, that's not, there's no neural distribution for the hand. It is a glove hypnosis uh, numbness. And, you know, you'd have a median nerve and an ulnar nerve, and you wouldn't have a hand nerve. Uh, so a hypnosis, a numb hand, is not the neurons in the normal way. And the acupuncture system is also not following neurons. You, you've got meridians going through you, energy system going through you. And where they exit the skin, that's the little acupuncture points. But there, you're, there, there's a, a complex field that you can actually measure around people. You don't end at your skin, you know. And, you know, we, we kind of think of ourselves as, as, as being contained within this container, but we're not, you know. Uh, uh, interestingly, Carl Prebrum, dear Carl, uh, uh, predicted that our memory was stored 
holonomically or essentially holographically. And th that we may have an interference pattern that we've got in our head that's an elect electromagnetic uh, interference pattern that's got little nodes that are active for one perception versus another, but that it doesn't end on our, on the edge of us. Uh, people can actually share archetypal memory at a distance. And uh, um, anyway, it, it opened uh, us up to all sorts of uh, uh, rather interesting quantum effects that uh, the, the old neurology folks where you had to stick a needle in it and see some spikes before you believe it was real or having trouble with these field things, you know. So uh, Carl, it took Carl a long time before they really recognized his genius. Uh, he received in 2012, I believe it was, uh, the, the uh, Career Achievement Award from the APA uh, uh, decades after he should have received it. His book, Language of the Brain, is still a great read. Kawakami uh, demonstrated pain control. Uh, uh, Kawakami sits on a stage. I, I think I sent you a picture of him, if I'm not mistaken. So he, he sits on a stage in a lotus position, and he has barbecue skewers, not sharpened. These, you know, use no barbecue skewers. It's got a point on it, but it's, it's not a sharpened point. You kind of jam it through the meat, you know. Um, so he's got a couple of those. Um, and uh, uh, he's sitting on stage, and uh, they, they hand him these uh, uh, nice sterile uh, barbecue skewers, and he sits them on the mat that he's sitting on and kind of rubs them back and forth. Uh, well, there went any sterility that you ever thought you had, you know? And, and he picks them up. He makes two folds in his neck. And he sticks it in and out and in and out. One, two, three, four sticks going in and out. And then he sticks one up through his tongue. Now, this was in Hassel Belt. What's that? I hear your dog whimpering there. He doesn't like this story. <laughs> well, I, I, I haven't tried it on him, believe me. Uh, uh, I wouldn't try it on myself even. But, you know, Kawakami is uh, doing this while he's projecting all of his physiology on the wall behind him. Muscle tension levels, electrodermal levels, uh, uh, temperature, uh, his EG on one channel. And I was there to tell him which channel where because we had already published a paper about how he controls his pain. So literally, you can see the spectrum with a bunch of little bar graphs and the lowest frequency bar graph is the slow cortical potentials essentially and uh, the slow cortical potentials are dancing away when your brain is busy it turns on and off networks so you've got the spectra of dancing you've got an alpha peak you know and, and the little beta fast stuff and as he's about to do the stick the the lowest frequency quits dancing it goes clunk and then all the others just kind of dampen out. The EG is just not active at all. He does the stick. Once he's done with the stick, up comes the low frequency, up comes the EG. And uh, he, he basically turns off the oscillatory EEG with the slow cortical potential. When you go electropositive, you can turn off EEG. So he, he just he learned how to turn off his pain sense. Now, he didn't learn it in a book. Uh, he didn't learn it by listening to a lecture. Uh, uh, he, <laughs> he did it the old fashioned way, torture. <laughs> uh, 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 go stand under that ice cold waterfall. Uh, stand over here while people whap you with split canes. Um, uh, you, you can learn to turn off sensation. It's not easy and it's not pleasant. I wouldn't recommend that method. I think that the electro electrodermal training is a lot better than being beat on the head or standing in an ice shower. So uh, um, it, it, it's something that he learned and uh, uh, could demonstrate quite well. He was the head of the Kundalini Yoga 
uh, school in Japan. He had an entire entourage that followed him around. He was 75 years old at the time. I'll be 75 this year. I tell you, he was solid as a rock. Uh, he, he was a martial artist as a younger man and was still, you know, obviously quite well practiced. Um, and uh, the, the, the entourage that went around with him uh, has skill sets uh, uh, similar. You know, the uh, 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 ast- astounding poses uh, with uh, one hand con- contacting the ground with all, you know, I mean, the, they were astounding, astounding uh, uh, self-control uh, being demonstrated by them, not just his pain control. But the in Belgium, the, the press was there, and they wanted to see his tongue. He pulled his tongue out so they could see there wasn't a pre-drilled hole in his tongue. He stuck his tongue and wagged it at him, and, uh, um, and they, they checked his neck. Hadn't been... There wasn't any pre-pierced spots or anything like that. So, uh, and and he doesn't do this. You know, this is a a demonstration that he does only rarely. This is not something that's performed uh, like Tuesday. a like like a fakir in in India trying to raise some money on the corner. You know, he's uh, uh, he's uh, actually uh, <clears throat> Sue Wilson was also part of the project with him and uh, uh, Sue's very uh, brash she's from Montana and and uh, uh, what you see is what you get with Sue she, she's right out front you know and uh, and and not demure uh, and he's traditional Japanese proper <laughs> and the two of them together were hilarious uh, uh, he he would do the no 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 uh, settle down for her and and she was you know uh, getting him uh, to do things so uh, it, the, the, they were quite the pair and uh, he had a a translator with him uh, th- that uh, uh, Sue and Eric Pepper and the translator were standing over uh, to one side of the stage. You kind of see them in the shadow off to the side of the picture if you've got the full picture. Anyway, the, uh, um, uh, Kawakami's uh, demonstration was really quite uh, striking. Uh, uh, the uh, people could realize that he had absolutely no response at all to the to the being stuck through the neck and stuck through the tongue no change muscle no change electrodermal i can i can clap next to you and wait a couple seconds and you get a big electrodermal sway you know and and for you to have no response to being stuck this that's an amazing level of self-regulation and you know he learned it uh, uh like i said the old-fashioned way but you know people can learn control uh, to the point where they don't respond with electrodermal and they can fake uh, a, a, a lie detector test. You don't have to st- step on a tack or something, you know, mm-hmm. the, uh, the, uh, you, you, you basically can end up learning to control uh, all, all of these. So, uh, so ne- ne- neuropathy can be trained. Yeah. You know, neuropathy is very much like a phantom pain. You haven't lost the limb, but you're you're not getting input from the limb, so you might as well have lost it. And uh, uh, any sensation from somewhere else will end up being perceived as pain in that area. So there's a thalamocortical dysrhythmia, which is, you know, areas around it invading that area. You have to look at the brain uh, to make sure that it's actually a full dysrhythmia in the brain and not just a simple... You know, there there's different levels of peripheral neuropathy, and and when it gets bad enough, you can end up having a, a thalamocortical dysrhythmia. If all you've got is a little tingling, then gabapentin is probably going to be sufficient to take care of it. It's a an anticonvulsant, but it's not really a primary anticonvulsant. It cuts down on hyperexcitable neurons, and that that cuts down on the peripheral tingling and needles. But if it's really, really bad, that's not going to be quite adequate. Lyrica is a little bit more potent, and then they bump up from that to uh, Lamictal and uh, and other primary anticonvulsants. Is fibromyalgia in the same ballpark? 
uh, fibromyalgia is a different uh, uh, clinical entity. Fibromyalgia, you've got multiple muscle groups that have trigger points. If you touch the trigger point, you're going to end up with an intense pain. Those trigger points are actually the in a muscle. You have muscle fibers that uh, that actually contract. Uh, that's the muscle that that moves things. But in there, there's a muscle. Uh, spindle and the muscle spindle when you poke it, it ends up having that pain uh, emitted muscle spindle is sympathetically innervated it's not the motor neuron that tells you to contract it's a sympathetic nerve that ends up setting your muscle tone and if you carry excess muscle tone chronically well go to the gym and stick a weight out front and just stand there and hold it How's that shoulder starting to feel? Oh, <laughs> it feels not so good. You got a shoulder pain going there now? Ah, well, chronic muscle tension can give you a pretty painful muscle. And you don't go to the gym and exercise by holding a weight out and holding it there until it hurts. At least you shouldn't. And if you're holding muscle tension because of your sympathetic nervous system, not your motor neuron, you're going to end up with these little trigger points. Now, that's it, uh, where the trauma component comes in as well here, uh, that there's a yeah. very, very high connection with or, or whether it's childhood trauma or uh, when, when individuals are slightly younger, but systematic trauma or, or key events are yeah. Uh, notably in females, which um, yeah. was not recognized before. Talk to your doctor. He'll tell you it's part of the involuntary nervous system and you can't control it. Ha, 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 ha. We do not agree. <laughs> Old idiot doctor will tell you that. You know, the biofeedback world uh, fought that fight in the 60s and 70s. And every single autonomic signal in the body can be volitionally controlled with operant conditioning or instrumental learning. Uh, you, you can learn to control it. Pupil diameter, uh, blood pressure, uh, electrodermal activity, you name it. If you've got it and you can measure it, you can control it. Stomach pH, gastrointestinal motility, all of those. And all I of those are back a little bit here, Jay, if you don't mind, just in terms of because we I mean, I've, I've heard that the 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 I would say the more dramatic um, stories I think we all have. But just to take this down a couple of levels, they're still rather extreme. But if you look at individuals that have been exposed to extreme experiences, so uh, whether um, systematic beatings as a child, so extreme physical child abuse, individuals in torture, they have also developed this capacity to turn off so to speak dissociate so, yeah yeah so so it is uh within all of us so it's just a matter of how we learn to use that instead of a dissociative protective state yeah. uh, as a way to influence i think that kind of loops back into the article yeah. that you sent us in terms of the hypnosis so if yeah. you can kind of the get into the belief fight structure. flight freeze yeah and yeah. when you can't get away uh the the, the animal usually feigns death yeah. And sometimes the big bear lets you go mm -hmm. and sometimes they just eat you, you yeah. know, so yeah. but, it hurts but it, less it's still it's an it's an adaptive attempt yeah. to, to survive. Yeah. And um, and if you're a very young child, you don't really have the ability to fight against uh, overwhelming, you know, uh, opponent. Yeah. So the freeze or. Uh, giving up, uh, internalizing, uh, dissociating, ends up being part of your repertoire. Yep. And uh, um, later in life, it's not necessarily something that's um, uh, uh, adaptive without uh, reason. Mm -hmm. And it's usually part of the psychopathology that's been induced by the ACEs that you've gotten uh, the uh, uh, adverse childhood experiences that have stacked up. You know, if, if you've been traumatized to that extent, you probably got like eight out of 10 or 10 out of 10 on the, yeah, on the aces. And that's, uh, that, that's a horrible circumstance. I'm sorry, fibromyalgia and neuropathy, are they considered chronic pain? I would say yes. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. And, and the efficacy for neurofeedback for chronic pain is pretty good, right? In, in fact, if you've got the right practitioner with the right techniques uh, that knows what they're doing, yes. Um, but there's a lot of different levels of practitioner. Some people are, um, you know, certified in one area and others are certified in another. So uh, you, you have to uh, uh, do your due diligence and you know, uh, check for the uh, credential and experience of the provider. Uh, uh, the fact that they have biofeedback and neurofeedback isn't necessarily sufficient to know that, that, they, that they're going to work with pain. Yeah, I would say here there's um, a, a really important component in terms of other, um, yeah, you know, scope of practice in terms of other areas of knowledge. You mentioned, you know, putting on the psychology hat, understanding, um, you know, whether there are other things compounding, blending in, like trauma history, um, just, you know, generalized arousal as well. You know, um, one is going to very precise locations in the brain and the other is just helping the, the, the individual to quiet either through the bio or the or the neuro. Um, but these, you know, there's a reason why they're called complex pain syndromes. These are not easy. Um, you know, whether it's good straightforward talk therapy, you know, having somebody understand, uh, you know, just being listened to uh, that's a key thing in a lot of these uh, syndromes i kind of joke a little bit the, the people become prickly with pain their personalities become prickly um, i would say the most uh, difficult people to work with tend to be individuals with complex uh, pain they come in you know trying to prove you know to you that that they need to be uh, listen to, and you don't want to be an enabler of that. You you want to essentially just uh, um, em embrace that, uh, let the individual know that they're really really understood without enabling it. It, it is it is a it is complex to treat. It's very complex to treat. If you go back to the beginnings of the biofeedback neurofeedback world's uh, encounter with pain as a topic, Manager Foundation. Uh, Elmer Green and Elise Green um, brought in Jack Schwartz uh, from the Eleuthia Institute, uh, which was a thing he had set up. Uh, he he was uh, uh, tortured in World War II and learned how to disassociate, and he was able to stick uh, skewers through his bicep and you know, th th things such as that as, as demonstrations. So they they did experiments with him uh, uh, back in the uh, late 60s and early 70s. Um, uh, they also had a Swami Rama over from uh, India who demonstrated pain control and uh, um, yeah, out-of-body experience uh, type stuff uh, for them. So uh, the, uh, the, the field has studied pain for a long time. Um, and again, it, it, it was solid enough to end up with a chapter and a book for medical students. So uh, it wasn't just all uh, fun and games. Uh, there, there was actually publishable neuroscience in it. And um, I, I'd reason, urge people to actually flip through the document. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and non-pharmacological. I mean, our, our go-to for, for any form of pain is pharma, pharma, pharma. And we all know it works to a certain extent. Um, and then it makes zombies and addicts out of people. Um, so in, in terms of um, exploring the non-pharma combinations, you know, I do like the, whether it's, you know, true blue uh, in-depth hypnosis and neuro, and bio, um, you know, I haven't found, um, shall we say, only doing neuro or only doing bio sufficient. You need to combine it with something else. Jay, would you agree with that? Yes, and um, I have. Uh, You're looking for something there. <laughs> yeah, I've got an old PowerPoint from a presentation I gave to a pain management group in the Bay Area. Um, and, uh, uh, this, this actually, um, uh, uh, talks more specifically ab about pain and, um, a little bit of the history behind, uh, pain and pain treatments, uh, early pain relief, you had nitrous oxide, which was usually produced 
and chloroform, which was a little bit more hazardous, but you could be knocked out with chloroform. Uh, ether was used in a in 1846, first time public display of successfully extracting a tooth in public with with basically uh, just ether as the uh, as the, the uh, knockout. Um, uh, they had frolics, as they called them. Uh, th these were huffers back in the day, um, and and they would take some of these substances and and frolic with them. Um, but then uh, along came opioids and cocaine, which were more potent. Um, uh, but uh, what you really have is opioid receptors and glia. And glia are where slow cortical potentials are regulated. So the interaction between pain relief and glial or slow cortical potential that ends up being really quite critical. You can turn off neural networks with a slow cortical potential, or you can use the ligand-gated ion channel and use opioids uh, to turn off the pain. So uh, the, the, this is, um, I, I think, uh, the, the link between a lot of uh, pain relief that we can end up seeing. Um, uh, you get cytokine and uh, chemokine re releases. Um, you can cut down on some of those just with ibuprofen or aspirin uh, for inflammatory stuff, but uh, y you, you can get glia involved in this again. For chronic pain, they're targeting glia uh, with medications now, including some of the medications based, based on THC. And, and uh, the uh, specific targeting uh, with with portions of the uh, of the uh, of the plant, C, uh, CBDs and uh, uh, chemo receptors. So uh, they're targeting glia, uh, and this is the pain relief. Uh, again, slow cortical potentials. How I learn to control the pain in my hand are basically glial. The, the control mechanism is glial. And uh, they, they're in process developing all sorts of drugs that target glia as a, a way to control pain. And uh, slow cortical potentials train your control of this with uh, ion channels as opposed to taking a uh, drug to control the glia uh, with the uh, uh, ligand gated ion channels. Okay. Anyway, uh, you've been here as well that you know sometimes it's a bit of a catch 22 when people are taking cer certain medications because of the chronic pain, um, and it, it actually minimizes the efficacy of the neuro because you can't access the uh, shall we say the fully activated or functional systems in order to intervene. So there are all kinds of catch 22s, uh, but yeah, sure, tell your client not to take their pain meds uh, the day they come in. <laughs> Yeah. The uh, here's Kawakami on stage. His projection behind him, and you can't quite see it over on the side here. There's Eric Pepper and Sue Wilson and their translator uh, behind there, and here he is. You can't see accurately, but he's got him stuck through his neck and through his tongue, and all of his EG e was in the bottom left hand corner. And um, anyway, the 2005, uh, back there. Anyway, uh, um, this was published. Uh, the, the, this is a Journal of Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback uh, in 2006. Uh, tongue piercing by a yogi. Uh, this, this we did the full QEG cap on him. It wasn't during that demo. Um, uh, that The demo was on stage um, uh, uh, here, 2005. This was published in 2006, but we did the uh, we did the research before that. Anyway, um, you can do DC stim. Uh, that's one way to control. You can activate or inactivate using direct current stimulation, um, and uh, uh, that that was uh, th that 
observation goes back to the second British medical journal. He was a little slow to submit. He didn't get into journal number one. You know, it's a, you just got to hit those deadlines, you know. And uh, so he's, he he's, was a, a, a sluggish guy, and he, he, he didn't make it until journal number two, uh, the, the second British medical journal, 1875. But he observed when you're looking at the brain, whenever an area becomes used, it, it goes electronegative. But it also went uh, red. You can see it flush red it's got more blood flow uh, and uh, perfusion in the area and they they could see 150 to 200 microvolts in a millimeter separating if you move the electrode probe a millimeter away you lost 200 microvolts so these are very structured fields like the acupuncture points that we saw if you move a millimeter or so away you lose all the voltage so Anyway, um, uh, you, you, you can change the excitability of the motor cortex with a stimulation. You can change sensation and somatosensory. Uh, and again, this is our uh, uh, 2010 publication about uh, uh, non-pharmacological pain management in, uh, in, a, in the, the book for uh, students. Anyway, that's that's the end of that. Um, and I also had. By the way, one little uh, shout out here in terms of you know it's quote unquote old tech. People aren't using um, it, it much anymore because of you know all the the, the fancier in office things. But good old fashioned CES units. Um, I'm glad they were mentioned in your in in your chapter. They're relatively affordable. Um, clients can take them home and use them and abuse them, um, and and they can be really really helpful. So Pete, your friends that has the uh, peripheral neuropathy um, uh, it doesn't it, when it gets more severe. Sometimes you don't just have the chronic buzzy, tingly, numbness, and sensitivity. Once in a while, you get the zingers, and um, you, you, you'll, you'll actually uh, have either a neuroma, which is a little bump tumory thing on a neuron. It's not a problem, but if you, if you squeeze it, it's like you just got hit by lightning. You know, just an absolute zinger. And they're usually brief, but sometimes they'll last a few seconds. Occasionally they reoccur, uh, but those zingers are a, a direct neuron uh, uh, ca catching a zap. And um, those are, uh, uh, by the time you start to get those, you usually have to be on a more primary anticonvulsant, not just uh, gabapentin or uh, pregabalin, uh, um, and, and Neurontin or Lyrica for brand names. But um, uh, but they usually have to go on to an anticonvulsant and lamictal, um, triloptol, uh, Keppra, something for the uh, piercing, stabbing uh, pains that end up happening. Is that a pain if, pump? Uh, no, if you get a pain pump, you're actually probably getting uh, something that slowly is titrating opioids into your uh, spinal column uh, to try to... Uh, uh, so that would uh, be pharmacological. Yeah, it sure is, and it's a really advanced way to uh, apply it locally, uh, and it also limits how much you can take. You can hit the button as often as you want, but it's uh, it's only programmed to give you so much, you know, max. So uh, um, anyway. Uh, um, by the time you're needing that kind of a thing, it's probably a real good point to have gotten to a neurofeedback, biofeedback uh, person to start training brain and or body locations to handle this better uh, because opioids long term end up being a slippery slope. As you take them, your glia replicate receptor sites. So 
the opioid level that got you effectively, you know, numbed out today won't work in a week or so. Never and, enough, never enough, never enough. Yeah, and it's a slippery slope, and eventually you're going to end up with the, the there's a, a uh, there's a, 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 a more mortal level that you're going to intersect at some point. You're going to suppress your breathing and um, you're, you're, you're going to pass from an overdose. And uh, well, even it, before that, you know, what, what, one of the, the tragic things we see is you, you have an addiction and no pain relief. So essentially you yeah. start because you get pain relief, you increase the dose, increase the dose. Yeah. Um, and for the pain. And then at a certain point, you do not get pain relief and yeah. but you, you still use regularly because of you've, the addiction. You've it's, got the nods. Your, yeah. your your consciousness is you're you're losing consciousness. Uh, they've they've got you sedated to the point where you're barely able to ha hang on to an awake state, and at the same time you still have pain. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and uh, th that's not a way to be. Before you get to that point, get to it, your it's, <laughs> yeah, get to somebody who can actually help you with the non pharmacological pain management, non pharmacological neuromodulatory approaches to pain management. That uh, uh, again, med school people read this chapter and probably skip past it merrily, thinking, "Well, we use meds," <laughs> you know. Uh, but uh, they, they at least will end up having somewhere in the back of their mind that there's other methods that are available for people. And about the time they've got somebody coming back for their third step up to a higher dose of opioids, they, they better think about their license and their patient because their patient's getting worse and their license is on a thin ice. Yeah. So but to get back to some of the pra practical, I think I mentioned it for, before, but I really want to reemphasize, um, you know, if you have somebody coming in and they just, oh, I just took a, a, um, an extra pain uh, pill to, to get here. OK, if you can um, essentially ask your client to delay taking the meds uh, before coming to their session or they um, that they're that they're wearing off because you'll find that um, you're much more successful in terms of the the, the actual work you do. And I know yeah. it's 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 really a horrible for the individual, um, but it, it's that your treatment or your training, I should say, is significantly yeah. more effective when they're not uh, on a full uh, dosage or active dosage at that point. Yeah, I've I've had patients approach me specifically um in a dire circumstance but they've uh, become uh, uh addicted at a level to uh, benzodiazepines which ruin the ability to see the eg yeah. and uh, uh, basically have had to tell them you're going to have to get under medical management and cut your dose down to a tenth of what you're taking before we can actually look at the eg and tell you what's going on yeah, right and now you're sharing like what what is the tipping point of efficacy? I mean, I know there's body weight and, and you know, the size of, of the individual. But um, what do you find is the um, the cutoff where neuro simply becomes ineffective? <laughs> well, it, uh, about the time you start to think you need more of it, you, it's becoming ineffective. <laughs> I tried a box. You can't do it. <laughs> There, yeah. There's no specific, you know, different people have different levels of, of sensitivity to it. You have, you have your own uh, uh, level of opioid receptors already. And if that's been manipulated from exposure, uh, you're, you're going to have a, a different reaction to it. Mm -hmm. um, people that have had react, had exposure, uh, go in for surgery and they don't respond to the, to the, to the anesthesia. Um, in a normal way. Uh, and by the way, redheads, I know, redheads yeah. don't respond to anesthesia in a normal way. Many and they have usually more minimum odd, yeah. odd pain reactions as well. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, you, you can speak to that more than I, I got a little bit of red hair in the beard once in a while, but uh, it's going more gray than red at this point. So yeah, I'm uh, not as brilliant as you, Jay, with tip of tongue, but there is a very specific gene 
65% of female uh, redheads have this, and we need a minimum of 30% more uh, anesthesia. So all of those little stories about people waking up on these um, uh, the surgery table, unfortunately, they are true, and they're all redheads. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and, and if they would have know, used the bispectral index to measure depth of anesthesia, they wouldn't have been awake. You know, you can maintain a proper level at that point. Yeah. So well, going look, back, going back, because I said they know this more now. But, you know, when, yeah. when I was in my 20s, uh -uh. <laughs> yeah. ouch. So, yep. <laughs> so uh, Pete, your buddy with the yep. sensitive uh, loss of sensation that becomes hypersensitive uh, and painful. Um, uh, to the extent that we can, uh, we can change the DC signal in the brain, but I learned DC control peripherally to turn off my pain peripherally. And the acupuncture points are electronegative. If you can flip them to an electropositive or essentially turn them off, you'll, you essentially aren't there in that part of your body to have sensation. You're, you, you literally extract yourself from the area that's gonna be stuck with a pin. And uh, you, you can teach that. I learned it, you know, I, I, uh, there, there's nothing special about the learning curve. You just have to have the right thing fed back. And uh, well, James, I had this poor, a- This poor guy had to go to the Mayo Clinic and they said there's nothing they can do. Like they don't even mention this. That's right. There's nothing they can do. Do they do what we do? Mm -mm. <laughs> you know, so uh, um, they're correct. You know, they, they can't do anything with their techniques, but there are te techniques beyond what they've got. And they teach it in medical school in England. You know, um, uh, U U.S. has quite a centrist uh, um, idea that we've got higher quality medical you know care here than anywhere else in the world and um you you've you've got to think twice about uh, the accuracy of that also many I'm, I'm going to to europe obviously but you know the the blend of pharma and other modalities is much much more com common in yeah. north america we're just pharma oriented pharma oriented the lobbying it's it's getting really bad up here in canada as well you know, in terms of what will be paid for pharma versus other forms of treatment. So, yeah, spread the word, folks. <laughs> Jake Uncleman. <laughs> hey, Pete. Thank, thank you for helping my, my, my buddy Mark out there. For HIPAA rules, we can't use last names. Dr. Marie Swingle, <laughs> the reddest of redheads who needs 30% more painkillers <laughs> than the rest. Thank you for another great episode of the Neuro Noodle Neuro Feedback Podcast. You got it. All right, guys. Take care. Have a great weekend. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. The Neuro Noodle Podcast is supported by listeners and businesses just like you.